cannot fail us. He never has failed us, and he never will fail us. It's, thank you, Kim. Uh, I'm going to tell on myself real quick here before I get going. Uh, when I was a when I was younger, younger, um, there was a time when uh, our family was driving down that road, and my sister. I mean, I'm laying there with my eyes closed, and my sister just reaches over and smacks me, and um, just totally unprovoked, uncalled for. Um, I don't know if I'm telling myself or telling my sister at this point, but um, she smacked me, and I think it's fair that you should know that. Um, what, but what happened was uh, <coughs> I was a little devious at that time in my life. It, it, there was a moment. I had a moment of weakness. And what what's happening was we were driving down the road. My sister got in trouble for smacking me, but what happened was my parents would look in the rearview mirror as I screamed because my sister smacked me, and then, you know, she got in trouble for smacking me. But then it happened again. And my parents got wise to this, so they started looking. What would, what would happen was I'd pretend to be asleep. I'd reach over and pull her hair real quick and then act like I was sleeping. And she'd reach over and smack me, and then she got in trouble. But um, then one day they saw it from the beginning to the end, and then I got in trouble. What they thought was, an, uh, was, was happening was an unprovoked smack by my sister to me, which is, exa is exactly what I wanted them to see. But um, that's not what was really happening. The Bible story that we're going to uh, bring up today is a completely unprovoked um, action. You know, sometimes kids will do that. One kid will be having a bad day and just lash out at the other kid who did nothing wrong. We see that stuff happen all the time. And if we're honest, we can't really say it only happens to kids. Sometimes it happens to adults too. I'm having a bad day and I'm going to share that with you. You know, that's, it does happen. But a lot of times it's unprovoked. The book of Exodus is a story of how God delivered Israel from Egyptian captivity and, and how he took care of them through the wilderness wandering. And we have many different stories in the book of Exodus, but the one I want to look at this morning seems to be completely unnecessary and uncalled for event. Why in the world did it happen? Nobody did anything. It's just this event happened. As Israel is peacefully passing through, the Amalekites decide to ambush them. They've never done anything to the Amalekites. There's no, uh, there's no conflict here. But the Amalekites step in and they decide to uh, ambush the Israelites. This is a nation that opposes the God of Israel. Wants nothing to do with the God of Israel. They're upset. They know the stories of the Red Sea cross crossing. They know the Egyptian captivity story, how God sent the ten plagues. They know about all this stuff, but they hate the God of Israel. So let's uh, start in Exodus chapter 17 in verse 8 and look at this story here. It says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. The, the Amalekites have declared war and Moses lays out the battle plan. Joshua, you go fight and I will take the rod to the top of the hill. And it sounds like a good plan if you're Moses Moses' side of this sounds, it's a pretty sweet deal. Joshua's part was to get right in the middle of the army who wants him dead, and Moses' part was to run to the top of the hill with a stick. You go in there and fight the Amalekites, and I'll go stand on top of the hill with a stick. Seems like a good plan. And it's a good plan if you're on Moses' side of the deal. It does sound, it sounds like a sweet deal. Now, the one thing that we don't see happening is Joshua complaining. He doesn't complain about this plan. Somehow this seems to be a good plan to Joshua too, and he obeys the battle plan here. You see, Moses doesn't just say that he's going to stand on top of the hill with a rod. He says he is going to stand on top of the hill with a rod of God. That, that's what he says. It's not, I'm going to go up there with my stick. No, he says, I'm going to go up to the top of the hill with the rod of God. Whenever you see a miracle performed by Moses, the rod is with him. Look, look, through, look through the stories of Moses. You'll see that every time he performs a miracle, he's got this rod with him. This rod represented God's power and God's presence. This was a representation that 
God was doing it. It could never be said that Moses performed any miracle on his own. Every time he performed a miracle, he had that rod with him. The message was very clear that God is the one doing the work. So that rod represented God, and, and Moses used that rod every time a miracle was performed. Moses was going to show the Israel that God was still fighting on their behalf. And God was going to reinforce Moses' statement with what happens next. Look at verse 11 with me. It says, And so it was, when Moses held up his hand, the, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one, on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. God made sure that both armies understood that he was standing with Israel. Both armies could see when Moses raises this thing up, Israel's prevailing. When he lets it down, Amalek is prevailing. When the rod was in the air, victory belonged to Israel. And Moses was making sure that they all knew that God was going to be first in his leadership. In, while I lead this nation, God comes first. So the plan seems bad. You go fight the Amalekites and I'll go stand on the top of the hill with a stick. The way we would normally look at that is a, is a bad plan. But what Moses was doing was we're, we're going to exalt God. We're going to magnify God in all this. And God is going to fight on our behalf. After the Amalekite army is defeated, God makes a promise to his people. Look with me in verse 14 of Exodus 17. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. God just marks it down. He, he's marking it down right here. There will be a day when the Amalekites will be utterly destroyed. That day is coming. The Amalekites are going to be wiped out. And he tells, jo or he tells Moses, I want you to write this down. And make sure you tell Joshua that day is coming. They, I'm going to wipe them completely out. And that day didn't come for many years. But in 1 Samuel 15, it finally shows up. And this is our text this morning. In 1 Samuel 15, let's look at this starting in verse 1. 1 Samuel 15, 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant, nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That's quite a list there. That's quite an annihilation. Saul is anointed as king of Israel and is told that it's through him that the Amalekites are going to be repaid for what they did to Israel. Yes, they are going to pay the price for what they did. The Amalekites still oppose God. Even on this day, the Amalekites are still in opposition to who God is, what he stands for, and what he does. God tells him to destroy everything that belongs to them, including their livestock. Take the livestock out too. Everything. It says, I said I would blot them out. That means totally erase them. I'm going to blot them out. So I want you to take everything that is in the possession of the Amalekites and I want you to remove that from the earth. The Amalekite culture was a poison throughout the nations around them. They served false gods and they were a vicious people. The culture had to be stopped. And even though God loved the Amalekite people, and God did love the Amalekite people, he could not allow the infection to spread. And, and we have to understand that we don't have an unjust, unfair God here. 
we have a God who sees the problem and it has to be removed. If you have an infection in your body, what you try to do is remove the infection so it does not spread. And that's exactly what he's doing with the Amalekites here. He knows that the infection is going to spread and he needs to remove that. So he commands Saul to take them all out. The Amalekites' hearts revealed that they were never going to repent. God was able to see that. These people are never going to repent. So we need to remove them so it, this influence doesn't spread. But Saul's heart was soon going to be revealed by his actions also. Look at verse 7 of 1 Samuel 15. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Now did Saul attack the Amalekites? Yes, he did. He did attack the Amalekites. Was this an act of obedience? Actually, no. It wasn't an act of obedience. Saul went in and attacked the Amalekites, but he did not destroy King Agag. Now, what was the command? To utterly destroy the Amalekites. Take everything out. And what's it say that happens here? It says he takes King Agag back with him. He spares this guy. He basically keeps the Amalekite king as a trophy. Our kingdom conquered your kingdom. And they he keeps... He keeps uh, King Agag as a trophy. But it also says that he kept the best of the sheep and the oxen. So Saul's not doing what he was told to do. He's keeping some things back. He held on to the things that were pleasing to him, but destroyed everything that he saw was worthless. That's what's going on in the story here. I, I'm supposed to kill everything. I'm supposed to wipe everything out. But man, that's, that's good livestock there. Those are good sheep. And the king, I can keep him. And I can show victory over this king and keep him as a trophy. This works out. This works out really good. What Saul failed to see was that sin always comes with the price and that price doesn't always just affect you. It, it spreads. God not only saw what Saul did, he also saw the heart that Saul did it with. So God speaks to the prophet Samuel and sends him to confront Saul. And when Saul sees Samuel coming, he greets him with a tone of celebration. You almost feel bad for Saul because he doesn't see what's going on here. But let's look at verse 13 here. It says, So uh, then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I did it. What God told me to do, I've done it. God commanded me to go in and annihilate the Amalekites and I did what he said and he says, hey, it's good to see you, Samuel. Saul doesn't realize that Samuel and God have already talked. But don't you hate that when somebody's got the inside scoop and you're not, you're not on the same page yet? Well, Saul's not on the same page yet. Like, oh, it's good to see you. Actually, it's not, but you feel like it is. Hey, I did what the Lord commanded me to do. I did what he said. You see, Saul was perfectly content with this, the decision that he made. I went in, I killed the Amalekites, I kept the king and kept the livestock, and everything's good. They're gone. They're not a nation anymore. We destroyed them. The Amalekites were defeated, and, got, and, and Samuel got to leave with something sweet out of the deal, too. I got to, do, I got to keep something that I liked, and, and I did what God wanted me to do. But Samuel was about to call him on his disobedience. And you can see Saul start to do what most people do when they're caught in the wrong. He starts throwing out good intentions and justifications. And by the way, you can all sit there right now and say, yeah, some, I did, when I was young, I did one time, yeah, I did that too. We throw out justifications and good intentions when we're caught in the wrong. Look at 1 Samuel 15, 14. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? And Saul said, now catch this. I highlighted these things for you. I want you to catch this. They have brought them from the Amalekites, 
For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Let's take a few seconds to look at the highlighted words here on the screen. Why do I hear sheep and oxen, Saul? Weren't you told to kill the sheep and the oxen too? Why do I hear sheep and oxen? They brought them. The people spared them. But we utterly destroyed the rest. Now he's involved. Look, isn't it amazing how we sometimes spin things the way we need to spin them to spare ourselves? It turns out that Saul was no different than most of us today. When our guilt is being investigated, we typically turn the focus to someone else, even if it's the person that accuses us. Hey, uh, you left your shoes where they don't, they don't belong. Well, you didn't take out the trash. Yeah, we, sp <laughs> we like to take the focus off of us and put it on to somebody else. And we all know that's true. We like to spin it in a way that you're not looking at my, my stains on my life. Well, let's, let's point to you. Spin it. That's, and that's what Saul's doing here. They did it. They spared the sheep. They did that. But we, that includes me too, we've utterly destroyed the rest. Saul's making the people look bad, but at the same time, he tries to spin it so he still looks good in the situation. He was told to destroy everything, but some of those things caught his eye. He liked those things, and he didn't want to let them go. I, I do like the cattle. I do like the sheep. I, and the king, th boy, that would be a claim to fame right there. I, I, I'm going to keep the things that are pleasing to my eye. And you can tell that he knows he's in the wrong by the way that he words the explanation. That's when he sweetens the pot by layering it with something that sounds honorable. Here comes the sugar coating. And we all know what that is. But this is what Saul does. It's, now it's time to place the sugar coating on it. He told Samuel that he kept the sheep in order that they could sacrifice them to God. Now, now we'll sugarcoat this. Were you supposed to kill the sheep? Yes! I was supposed to kill the sheep, but let's pour some sugar on this. We we're going to sacrifice them to God. And he, he likes that, right? We, let's sugarcoat the whole thing. And it sounds extremely noble, but Samuel was not about to have the, the wool pulled over his eyes at all. Look at verse 16 with me. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. Saul just had his chance to confess everything. He had his chance to repent or at the very least finish the job. He had, a, he had an opportunity here, but instead he sugarcoats everything. And the fact that Samuel said, I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night, now tells us that God had already determined the outcome if there's no repentance. Now Saul knows, oh, you've spoken with God already about this. Yeah, let me tell you, I'm here because God talked to me about this issue last night. Look at verse 17. It says, So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Samuel is actually giving Saul one more chance to turn back here. He points out that Saul is only in the position that he's in because God placed him in that position. You remember when you were nothing and God put you as king over Israel? Remember that? God gave Saul the victory over the Amalekites. And Saul took spoils from them instead of removing them altogether. Everything God had done for him, the only question left to ask is, why didn't you obey? Why didn't you obey? God's been so good to you, Saul. And all he wanted you to do was go in and obey his command. So all, let me remind you of where you are, who you are, because of what God did for you. Look at all the blessings that God sent your way. And let me ask this one question. Why 
didn't you obey? After everything that God's done for you, why didn't you obey? Look at verse 20. It says, And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back King Agag, or Agag, king of Amalek, or Amalek, I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Saul had convinced himself that his partial right action was good enough. Why didn't you obey? I did obey. But it, did you notice what he said there? I did obey. But the people took of the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, which should have been destroyed. Do you catch the problem in his speech there? I did obey, but they took of the sheep that God said to destroy. So did you destroy them? Well, no, we took them. Then how in the world did you obey? He, he's, he's getting caught in a circle in his own conversation here. To do what is right and to come out with what's pleasing to himself seems like a win-win situation. I can obey God, but I can still get something out of the deal. But partial obedience is always complete disobedience. And it always will be. Sugar-coated sin is still sin. It's still sin. Even after Samuel pointed out that Saul had disobeyed, Saul's response was, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I did, I did obey. Saul had gotten to the point where he was comfortable redefining what was right and what was wrong. He was able to see his disobedience as obedience. He convinced himself that it's okay. It's okay. Even though I'm doing something wrong, it's okay. It'll be all right. Look at verse 22. It says, So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. But because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Saul finally gets it. It finally hits him. I have sinned against God. But it's too late. He's already going to be removed from the throne. God's already going to take him off the, the throne. Saul acknowledges that he was not listening to God, but he was actually listening to all the other voices that were being screamed into his ears. The society around him was declaring what was right and wrong, and Saul eventually started listening to that. We live in a society that is telling us that right and wrong is different than what God says right and wrong is. We live in that today. There are so many voices screaming out at us saying, hey, that's okay. I know God said, but let's, let's spin this to make it work for us. What Saul was never going to know was how that decision was going to affect those who came after him. He was never going to see this. When people start believing that their bad decisions will only affect themselves, they're missing the inner workings of sin. Sin does not only affect you. Sin spreads. Sin affects the people around you. Your sin is not only, it's not a personal matter here. Your sin will affect other people. Saul was never going to see how it spreads, but it spreads. And that is why God found it necessary to remove the Amalekites. It's an infection and it will spread. And they've got to be removed. Because of Saul's disobedience, future generations were going to have to deal with the consequences of his decision there. Saul took King Agag captive. And even though he ended up being killed anyway, some of his family got away. Saul did not utterly destroy the Amalekites like he was told to do. Somebody slipped through the cracks. When we get to the book of Esther, we see a man named Haman who is trying to destroy the Jews. And we're going to the end of the Old Testament time here when we get to the book of Esther. And we see this guy named Haman show up on the scene. He devises a plan to wipe the entire nation out, but God intervenes. Usually we do not see King Saul as a character in the book of Esther. 
King Saul's been dead for a long, long time. We don't see him as a character in this book, but the truth is he plays a rather big role in the story, even though it happens centuries after Saul's death. Esther hears about Haman's plan to destroy her people, and she goes before the king to beg for the king's mercy. This is where King Saul's involvement is in the story. Look at Esther chapter 8 and verse 3. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite in the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. Haman was a descendant of King Agag, the king who Saul took as a trophy somehow has descendants now. He wasn't supposed to have descendants. But then we see this guy who's in the same family show up in the book of Esther years later. Generations after Saul's disobedience, the Amalekites reconnect with the Israelites. They were supposed to be wiped out. They were supposed to be taken out. But Saul says, yeah, but I saw something I wanted. I obeyed God, but yet I hung on to the things that I wanted for myself. But I did obey the voice of the Lord. No, you didn't obey the voice of the Lord because he said, wipe it all out. Now, why did God want it wiped all out? Because he knew even a little bit left over was going to spread. And we see it show up again in the book of Esther. It was supposed to end in, the, in 1 Samuel, but it shows up again in the book of Esther. Haman was a descendant of King Agag. It's almost mind-blowing to think about it, but the book of Esther actually finds its origin in the day that Saul decided to sugarcoat his sin. Do you see that the book of Esther starts there? You're supposed to take him out. Yeah, I let it slide. And now the book of Esther is starting to be created even back then. Years ago, I took a group of teenage boys camping. If you're crazy enough to do it, go ahead and try it. But I took a, I took a group of teenage, I was a youth pastor and I decided I'm going to take these guys camping because that sounds like something I can handle all by myself. So I, I went ahead and did that. I don't know, I had seven or eight teenage boys against one youth pastor. I, I got this. I've got this. Well, I can't go into all the stories of the evening, but it was an interesting evening. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't got this. But I, I thought I had a decent chance here. Before we, we had crazy adventures all evening long, and then uh, before we went to bed, a park ranger came through and told us to put the campfire out. Before we go to bed, make sure your campfire's out. And I assured him that we would. And then he did something that I totally was not expecting. He said, he asked me, how are you going to put it out? Like, we're going to pour water on it. There's a river over here. We're going to pour water on it. And he told me that there's more to it than that. Like, okay, I thought water takes out fire. I thought we were good to go. I was a young youth pastor. I didn't know what I was doing. It's just, yeah, we're going to pour water on the fire. That usually works. At least in legend it does. I thought we'd try that. He says, there's more you need to do. He said, after you pour the water on it, you need to stir it up. And then you need to pour more water on it. And then you need to stir it up again. And then pour more water on it. That is when you put the fire out. It seemed like a little bit of overkill to me, but, but we followed his instructions. Like, all right, well, sounds like the Elijah story, you know? Uh, yeah, I'll just keep pouring water on this. So we did it. We poured three buckets of water on this fire. We stirred it around, and then we went to bed. His main concern was not that we put the fire out. His main concern was that we put every spark out. And I don't want the, I just, I'm not asking you to get rid of the flames. I'm asking you to get rid of all the sparks. I want, I want you to put all the sparks out, not just the fire. Even though I thought he was asking a little bit too much, he was absolutely right in being so cautious. Because later on that night, we woke up to a very healthy campfire. <laughs> I woke up in the middle of the night, and there was a campfire going. I'm like, all right. So I thought, some guy, did, some, one of these teenage boys decided to wake up in the middle of the night and start a campfire. I'm going to find out who. I woke them all up. Who started the fire? Nobody started the fire. They were all sleeping. Like, who started the fire? We overlooked that inside those logs there were plenty of embers. 
inside. Even you could pour all the water you want on it, but the embers are inside the logs too. And I overlooked that. I, I didn't realize I needed to get that too. The park ranger was absolutely right. It's not out when you pour the water on it. Water doesn't put out fire the first time. You've got to make sure. I don't want the fire put out. I want every spark put out. Well, inside the logs, there's a lot of sparks that the water doesn't touch. And later on that night, it decided to come back to life. And I, their mysterious campfire happened that night. I was supposed to put out every spark. You see, that park ranger understood the danger of one spark, and he was definitely taking it more serious than I was. He understood that because he's seen more than I've seen. We didn't see the danger in leaving it the way it was, so we went to bed. We were perfectly content leaving things the way they were because we didn't see it as something to be concerned about. If we're not careful, we begin to view sin the exact same way. We do the same thing. Sin does have a hint of pleasure in it, and we all know that. Sin does have a, a hint of pleasure in it. And it appeals to the flesh, and it is desirable for the time. The Bible even tells us that there's, there's pleasure in sin for a short time. For a season, there is pleasure in sin, but it leaves you empty. If you don't see the danger in it, you'll never stop doing it because you actually like it. So you're going to continue. I, I just want to keep the sheep and the oxen. Oh, God, I'm not going to do all these other things. I'm just going to keep this one little sin. No big deal. It's just one spark. I'm just going to keep... The, the flame has been extinguished. I'm just going to hang on to that one spark. That's all I want. Just, just this. That's all I want. And when we find that hint of pleasure... We also find a way to sugarcoat it so it doesn't look so bad. We, we learn to justify our sins. Well, it's, that's not what God really meant. Well, look how bad their sin is. You know the whole, they did this, the people did that? Look at their sin over there and let me hang on to my one spark. My spark isn't as bad as their flame. So we justify what we do. Hang on to that sin, it's okay. It's not as bad as these other sins. We try to sugarcoat everything. And we all know that the things, we all, every one of you and, and myself included, we know the things that are wrong. We, we understand those. When you're wrong, you know you're wrong. You don't have to tell anybody. They might even know, but you don't have to tell them. When we're wrong, we're, ro we're wrong. We know the things in our lives that are actually sin and we recognize the behaviors that are contrary to the character of God. We do know that. We understand that. The reason that we continue in them is because we don't confess them. Now, here I want to dig deeper on this one spot here. The reason that we continue in our sin, even though we know they're wrong, is because we don't confess our sin. That's, that's our problem. We, you're not confessing that sin. And many times we define the word confess as telling someone what we've done. That's what confession is, right? Everybody would agree that's how we define that. Confessing is to make known what you've done or just confess it. Just tell somebody about it. Let me tell you something. There's a secret. I'm going to let you in on this secret. God already knows. <laughs> so why does he tell us to confess something that he already knows? If confessing means to tell somebody something that we've done and God already knows, then why does God want us to confess? Why? He, are, he not only saw our actions, He actually saw the heart behind our actions. He knows more than just what we did. He knows the heart behind what we did. He knows a lot there. So what does God mean, like in 1 John 1, 9? Let's look at, this, look at this verse. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In order to receive salvation, we need to confess sins. Are they because he doesn't know about them? No, he already knows about them. God knows about all the sins. But he says to confess your sins. But in order to live in a growing relationship with Christ after salvation, we also need to confess our sins. Do we, do we realize that? We need to confess our sins even after we're saved. We're not asking for more forgiveness. Again, we've already got all the forgiveness we need. That's not what we're trying to do here. But God does want us to confess our sins. If I have sinned after salvation, I have committed a sin, then I need to confess that sin. 
So do I, does it mean I need to tell God something he already knows? Absolutely not. We need to dig deeper here because God's not saying, hey, tell me, I'll pretend not to know and I just need you to tell me about this. That's not, that's not what's going on here. He says, I want you to confess it. In order to receive salvation, we need to confess our sins. And even after we're saved, when we do sin, we need to confess our sins. Let me show you another place where the word confess is used in the Bible. Philippians 2.11 and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, are we informing Jesus of something he doesn't know about here? Oh, by the way, you're Lord. I, I, I knew it all along. I, I had a feeling I was Lord. You know, no, we're not telling him something he didn't know. The word confess here actually means to agree about something. It means to agree on that matter. When we are confessing our sins, we are agreeing with God that it was wrong. We are agreeing that it was sinful. I agree. I agree with you. And until we see that there is danger in one spark of sin, we will not actually focus on extinguishing it. Until you agree that there is danger in that spark, you're not going to worry about putting it out. It's not going to be a huge issue to you. Kind of like when we had that campfire going. I went to bed perfectly content that I had done enough to protect um, our, us from seeing another campfire that night. Those sparks were not important to me. I didn't focus. I would have had to agree with the park ranger that that was a potential problem in order for me to put any action behind it. And when we don't see the danger in one spark of sin, we don't focus on taking that spark out. And if we're finding even one spark of pleasure in it, we will sugarcoat that and justify it. Yeah, but I like that sin. I'm finding pleasure in that sin. I want to keep that sin. Why aren't you getting rid of it? Because I don't agree with God on what it is. I will not confess it. I will not agree with you. And that's a scary place to be. I know I'm supposed to confess my sins, God. Well, I did this. There, I confessed it. <laughs> That's not what I meant. I need you to agree with me on what that is. Are you wrong? You know those times when we're supposed to tell somebody else that we're wrong and how hard that is? I was, you know, that, that sentence that we've all used? I was, that God wants us to do that too. Do you see what you did? Yes. What is that? It's wrong. It's sin. It's unrighteous. It's unjust. And it's an infection. And I need it removed. Because it will spread. When we start seeing sin the same way God sees sin, now we're confessing. We are agreeing with Him of what that is. There will never be a true change until we acknowledge the wrong in what we are doing. Because if you don't see it as a problem, you're not going to put it out. Then that, let's just be honest there. If you don't see a problem, you're not going to work hard to find a solution for it. It's not a problem. I'll deal with it later. It's no big deal. Many times we do exactly what Saul did. We sugarcoat our sins to make them taste better because nobody likes that bitter taste of being wrong. None of us. So we just sugarcoat something and make it taste a little bit sweeter. Society might tell you that your sin is okay. Culture may find your sin perfectly acceptable. You can watch things on television and say, yeah, they did it there. It's no big deal. The people at work do this kind of stuff all the time. It's no big deal. So society accepts it. So therefore it must be okay. You know what you're not doing? You're not confessing your sin. You're not agreeing with God of what that really is. God says, I want you to agree with me on what that is because I care about you and I love you. I don't want you to be hurt. Right and wrong cannot be defined by someone else's opinion of what right and wrong are. God already established what it is. And confessing our sins is agreeing with God what He said they already are. It's poisonous. It's destructive. It's going to hurt me. I'm wrong I'm wrong. Confess the sin. That means I agree. 
I agree, it needs to be put out. Sin is poisonous and it destroys and it spreads and it, it will spread. If you believe that your sin will not spread, then you are not seeing the potential of one spark. You know, I felt like an idiot that night that the campfire came back, but now, you know, as I was working on this sermon, I'm like, oh, look at that. I'm not an idiot. It was an illustration. That's all that was. You know, God just used it as an illustration. I see how, or I see, I wasn't, the, I wasn't the idiot. God was just using that for an illustration. But the, if you think about it, the illustration works. It's deadly. When we think of sin and we see that one spark, oh, it's no big deal. We'll just let it go. One spark can ignite the flame. And before long, you've got a problem that can spread so far out of control that there's nothing you can do about it. Even future generations can deal with the effects of that one spark that you allowed to keep going. Just like it did for Saul. The more I listen to the media or scroll through Facebook or just observe just basic advertisements, the more I see that sin is being sugar-coated at every angle. It's being sugar-coated all the time. And this generation is eating it up. We are living in a generation that is suffering from sugar-coated sin. They don't know the danger of that one spark. But I think we all know the danger of the spark. And we need to lead by example to this generation that does not see this. It's been sugar-coated. They need to know the danger of what they're dealing with out there. Even though society says it's okay, God said it was wrong. And we need to confess, we need to agree with him that it is wrong. The reason that I preach against sin is not because it's some kind of self-improvement program. That's not why I preach against sin. The reason I preach against sin is because I care about you and I want what's best for you. The reason God tells us about sin is because he loves me and he, he wants what's best for me. So I want to share that with you also. Sin is what originally separated us from God. Sin's what cost Jesus Christ his life. It's what's, it, what hinders the light of God shining out of our life. That spark can do a lot of damage. So to sugarcoat sin means we're hanging on to that one thing that's keeping that light from shining, reminding Jesus of why he had to die, and causing a wedge in our relationship with God. Well, we're not growing like we should be because we're hanging on to something that's unhealthy. Sin is poisonous. It will destroy us. Sin's ultimate agenda is destruction. And when we sugarcoat it, we're disagreeing with God on how harmful that actually is. I don't know where you are in your life right now. I don't know what you're dealing with. Sin appeals to the flesh. So every one of us are susceptible to it because there's pleasure in it and it does appeal. Temptations, the reason why temptations are so tempting is because there's appeal. It's, otherwise it wouldn't be tempting at all. I don't know what you're going through in your life. You might, be, you might be sitting here tonight or today thinking, you know what? He's talking about that one sin. Well, God may be. I don't know what it is. I don't know. But I'm telling you, if we sugarcoat those sins and we allow those sins to continue on in our lives, even though we know that God's not happy with that thing, if we allow it to go on, that means we're not agreeing with God on what that is. I said it was wrong, but it's okay. The God of all the universe, the all-knowing God says it's wrong. Can you, can you believe that sometimes we disagree with him? I know everything. Yeah, but I want to inform you on something. Yeah, you know it's wrong, but I want to tell you, it's okay if. It's okay when. Everybody else is. Turn the focus somewhere else. God says your sin, that one spark, is going to destroy you and it's going to spread and it's going to affect other people too. Acknowledge that. Confess your sin. Agree with me on what that is. The harm on that one sin. If we don't do that, then all we're telling God is we don't agree with you. And that's just the, the bottom line. We are telling God, I'm going to hang on to that because I do not agree with you on what you said that is. Sugar-coated sin is still sin. It's still sin. And God gave us a really good example of the life of Saul here and shows us the effects of what sin can do. 
make sure we are standing where we're supposed to be standing with God because a whole world without God needs God and you are supposed to be the light to shine to the rest of the world. Stand with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this example.